Hi, everybody. My name is Cynthia Martell, and I work for Virginia Cooperative Extension out of Franklin County as the Ag and Natural Resources Agent specializing in dairy science. Today, I'll be talking to you about small-scale dairy with cows or goats. This is part of a series on raising dairy animals and small-scale farming. What I'll go over to you today is just some of the key things you need to look for and think about if you're going to be starting up a small-scale dairy on your farm or in your area. Today's agenda in this video will be talking about picking your species, whether you pick cows versus goat, what are your needs, and how can that be possibly played into the composition of the milk that you're given, what are the animals' needs, what type of equipment you may need if you're going to start up a small-scale dairy, how when you're raising those animals, how you manage your pasture and you look at feeds, and then some of the types of housing, fencing, and the thoughts of what happens when you have sheep or goats, uh, sorry, goats or cows on your farm and how predators play a role. So the question for you when looking at starting a small scale dairy is are you gonna start with cows or goats? Or are you gonna do a combination of both? So we need for you to understand what species you're gonna pick that's gonna meet your needs. So if we look at the cows, these are the five main cow dairy breeds that you will mostly see in the US, minus um, the milking shorthorn, which is not shown. So most cases when you're looking and driving through the, the country, you're gonna see dairy cows. Most typically what you're gonna see is Holsteins and Jerseys. Those are the two main breeds you're gonna see on commercial dairy farms. Now, for your needs, if you're a small scale dairy, you may pick a different breed. You may pick a breed based on what breed you really like or what the needs are for your business. Holsteins are typically the number one cow being used on some of these bigger, larger commercial farms because they have the highest milk production. Typically, they're one of the biggest breeds, along with the brown Swiss is another one. They're both hitting about 1500 pounds and brown Swiss can also give you a good amount of milk. They're typically seen for their longevity and their calm temperament. The other breed that we typically see showing up on a lot of our farms is the Jersey. And a lot of people that are involved in small scale dairying pick a Jersey because they are the smallest breed, roughly about 900 pounds, and they are known for their butter fat. The other animal, the other cow breed that has really high quality protein and butter fat is our Guernseys, and they're typically seen as that medium size along with the Ayrshire, which also is another medium sized animal. But if you were looking for two cows that are going to give you um, good amount of butter fat, most typically you're seeing animals picking Jerseys and Guernseys. Now, if you're going to look at a small scale dairy goat farm, there's lots of different breeds of dairy goats that you could pick from. I just picked out five common breeds that I know offhand and see a lot of in the work that I do. So typically the dairy goat farmers that I'm seeing around my area are working with Alpine, La Manchas, Nubians, Hagenbergs, and the Nigerian Dwarfs or they're looking at a mix of say Alpine La Mancha, Nubian La Mancha, or, or looking at some of the other smaller dwarf size. It all comes down to picking what species meets your needs, what you're gonna do, but also what your facility can handle or your property can handle. Um, the Alpine La Mancha, Nubian and Toggenberg are larger, on the scale for, for goats, and then you have your dwarf breeds or your miniature breeds. If you're looking at an animal that's going to give you high butter fat, in the case of like the cows, typically people are looking at La Manchas for high butter fat, but also the Nubian breeds. And then they may do a cross La Mancha Nubian because the Nubians are known for their quantity of milk. So for your small scale dairy, you need to think about your end goals. That is gonna help you determine 
whether you're going to pick a dairy cow or a goat, dairy goat, and what breed you're going to pick. So know what your end goals are. If you already have a few cows and you've thought about getting a little bigger or a few goats a little bigger, know your end goals as well. Or if you, this is in the back of your mind that, hey, I have property, I want to start up a small scale dairy. What are you going to do with that milk? Are you only going to retain it for your personal consumption? So maybe you have a family, whether it's smaller or larger family, you may only need one dairy cow. But I would suggest maybe having more than one um, or different ages or maybe a dairy cow and some beef cows or dairy cows and some goats because animals like to be together. They're herd animals. Are you thinking about doing what people are doing nowadays, which is called herd shares, where you have a contract um, with other individuals that they are paying in and owning part of that animal and that contract in that per purchase of that animal helps you pay for the milk that's being processed and they're getting so much each week. Or are you thinking about becoming a cheese maker or getting into soap making? So those are some of the end goals you need to think about even prior to you purchasing these animals. What are you going to do with them? Some of that can come down to the composition too. Like what's your end goals? What are you going to do with it? So between cows and goats, they're very similar in milk composition from the standpoint of the lactose, protein, and fat. Where the differences come into is the protein structure. It is said that a lot of people with allergies to milk can often drink goat's milk and that the other um, perception is that there's that natural homogenization to goat's milk because the protein structure is different. So goat's milk has smaller, so smaller fat globules, and so it actually stays in suspension longer. So that's why there's that perception that it's naturally homogenized. And then say you want to get into making some of these uh, or artisanal types of cheeses that's where a lot of people pick up goats and go from the goat side of things because goats are browsers they eat a lot of those plants that cows don't eat that have those aromic and flavor compounds in them and so when they eat those they actually are adding smell or flavor to their their milk which then in turn can add flavor to the milk the fluid milk or the cheeses that are being made. So that's why a lot of people on the small scale side of things that are going into cheese making may pick goats over cows because they want that flavor or they want to be able to feed their their goats something that has that aromic flavor to it and then they can get it in transmit into their milk. But either thing that you pick, so whether you're picking um doing personal consumption or herd shares, or you're going to get into cheese making. One of the big things you need to look at is the setup. So for instance, this farm here in these pictures actually is doing both personal, but also herd shares on this farm. And they're doing it with Jersey milk. That is A2A2 A2 Jersey milk and then goat's milk. And they're also making cheeses and yogurts with their herd shares. And they've set their facility up so that if they purchase other parts and other equipment that they need down the road, they could go and to, they could actually possibly be, if they wanted to get bigger as well, be a grade B permit holder. Um, in the state of Virginia. But for right now, they're doing personal consumption, but also they do herd shares for both their cows and their goats. And they have a strong contract that goes with that. So you can see here in the refrigerator, they have um, this refrigerator is only used for holding um, those, those products. 
Now, if you're looking at possibly going into making soap from your products, whether it's um, from your goats, that's one of those other nice little niche markets as well. And to make yourself successful, you need to have great marketing. So if you look at this farm here that is also located in Franklin County, along with the other farm that's doing the herd shares, a lot of their pictures on their farm and how they market their farm for selling their goats, milk, soap is using their animals as the backdrop and their farm as the backdrop and having cute little labels. But she also makes a lot of soaps with different scents and incorporating all natural things into her soap making. To do either one of those things, whether you're using the fluid milk to for personal, for fluid milk, or for cheese production, or you're going into soap making on your small scale dairy farm, you need to think about the equipment. Now you can keep it simple or you can go a little more high tech. Whether you wanna milk those animals by hand, make sure you have a good setup that works for you. As you can see in the middle picture here, this goat is on a stand and the person's able to sit right next to it and milk it by hand. Your dairy cow, you're typically down on a little stool doing it um, by hand as well into a pail. Or you can, if you have the, the funding, um, the money, you can look into getting pail milkers, whether you're doing an animal one at a time or you have a little stanchion barn like this and you can milk multiple cows at a time, or you could have a setup like this for your goats as well and milk multiple goats at a time. And then either into these pails or possibly you have it set up where you have a small pipeline in a small bulk tank and that milk gets moved into your milk house by the, via the pipeline and into a small bulk tank. Or maybe you have a combo of dairy goats and dairy cows. In this case, in this farm, they have a combination. They milk dairy goats and dairy cows. They can milk four goats, um, well, two goats at a time, but having four goats set up and ready to go. You can see they have their side-by-side -side stands here. The goats are being fed their grain at the same time. And once two are done, they can switch it over and do the other two. Now on this farm, at this time, they can only milk one of their cows at a time. Um, with the bucket milker here, pail milker, um, but their goal is to be able to have it set up where they can milk multiple cows at a time as well. Granted, their goal is not to get huge, um, but maybe milking five or so cows at a time um, or two at a time, kind of like their goats. But in both cases, they're able to feed their grain to their animals to be able to monitor how much grain they're getting at the same time they're being milked. The other thing you see here in this parlor setup is the white walls. Those white walls are washable white walls that meet the state requirement. If this farm wanted to become a grade A or a grade B dairy in time, they worked from the beginning with the state milk inspector to set everything up to in the future, if they wanted to, they could meet all the guidelines and requirements. So some of the things you need to remember when setting up your your milking parlor or your milking facility because you are producing a high quality safe product and that requires proper facilities. You need hot water, lots of hot water. It's good to have washable walls so you can wash them down and have the ability to chill that milk quickly. You wanna be able to chill the milk as fast as you can down to 36 degrees. Think about this way, that milk is coming out of those animals at roughly 101 degrees. So you need to be able to chill it quickly. So you can actually buy small um, little mini bulk tanks. Um, there's a couple of companies that you can buy those from, one of which is in Pennsylvania or Wisconsin. And they're small little bulk tanks, or if you're going a little bigger, you could get a, a smaller one that isn't just for small scale farming, but you wanna make sure you're keeping your goat's milk. If you're doing a combination farm, your goat's milk and your dairy cow um, milk separate. 
You also want to have separate rooms for milking your animals in and your your parlor and your milk house kept separate and then a separate area where you're producing that end product. So if you're making cheeses, yogurts, spreads, or soaps, you want that area to be separate from where the milk is coming and being milked out of those cows. And like I said before, if your end goal is to possibly become a grade A or grade B farm, start working with that state milk inspector from the beginning. Now I said you could keep it simple or you can go a little more high tech if you have the means to do this. This is one farm here in Franklin County, Virginia. Um, the one that I've been showing you a lot of the pictures of that has the, the combination dairy cow and dairy goat. Um, they have separate little bulk tanks for their cow's milk and the goat's milk. They have their glass jars. Um, they're using the glass mason jars with the plastic screw on lids to store their milk in once it comes out. Everything is kept separate, whether it's uh, cows or, or goats. And uh, you can actually see that in the size of the jars that are being used to back in the refrigerator before. And then this is what their milk house looks like. It's clean. Um, it's organized. Um, she has ample hot water. She has cement floor to be able to wash it down. She keeps everything up off the floor, as you can see, um, and keeps the things that have been cleaned and sterilized up high and has the ability to wash everything down, including the walls. Water is very important for the washing of all your equipment and you have to remember, you need a place for all that wash water to go afterwards. So setting up um, a, whether it's a, like a mini pit or a septic tank, you, you need to know where all that water is going to go. One of the other things that can help you determine whether um, a small farm dairy is going to work for you and what type of animals you can have on your farm is to determine whether you want sheep or goats, that can come down to what your acreage is, what type of facilities you have available and that need or want. How many animals do you want? How many animals do you need? So a lot of times when people have a small farm footprint and it can't, um, and they know they wanna go into making, having their own milk and making cheeses or soaps, but they don't have enough acreage for cows then the dairy production for with goats is that alternative enterprise for your small farm or maybe your part-time operation. And how you can figure that out is looking at pasture stocking rates. So what a stocking rate is, is looking at a ratio for stocking that. This is figuring on average pasture, so average quality pasture. Now, if you don't have average quality pasture or you are just beginning and you have really no pasture, no grass in that pasture, then you want to reduce your numbers down. Or if you have high quality, good quality pasture and a good stand of it, you may be able to increase your numbers by just a little bit. But a stocking ratio is um, 0.5 animal units. So it goes back to your animal units. And so 0.5, if you think about it this way, is 100 pounds of an animal grazing per acre. So if you went and picked the small scale dairy cow and you looked at a Jersey, like I said, they typically run about 900 pounds. So we'll make it easy here and go with a thousand pound animal. She is one animal unit. So for her, it would actually, she would need two acres of average pasture. So if you only had two acres, you are setting yourself up for only one dairy cow. Whereas on that two acre pasture, you may get away with having anywhere from five to 15 goats. That would be the equivalent. So if you had more land, maybe you had 20 acres of average quality pasture, you, that land could possibly support 10 cows or 15 to 30 goats. Remember, think about it on that thousand pounds of animal for a, for a cow. Um, so just think about your goats of how much they weigh. And that will help you determine your stocking rate and keeping it 
stocked to the amount that your land can be able to provide for. Using the stocking rate ratio is going to help you in the long run because any pasture you have, pasture management is key. Knowing your stocking rate and knowing the weight of your animals to help you figure out your stocking rate is going to, one, prevent overgrazing. And how you can prevent overgrazing, one, is through your stocking rate, but establishing a higher quality pastures for your animals and making sure there's ample amount of grass in there, rotating those pastures. So what we have, what we call is rotational grazing, setting up into pasture lots where the animals can come off and rotate to another lot and giving that ground that they've come off of ample time for it to recover. Um, the best is allowing those animals to be off of it, that pasture they just came off of for 21 days, but also allowing those pastures not to be grazed down too low. Another thing you can think about in helping maintain your pastures is um, providing access to hay year round for if you're at a small scale dairy. Um, you typically probably won't have silage like some of these bigger farms, but providing um, good quality hay year round and having an area for that and also providing a sacrifice lot. So if you get a lot of rain or we go through a drought, you want to be able to make sure you can take those animals off those pastures to make sure your pastures last longer. We don't want to tear them all up when it's really wet and we don't want the animals to eat it all down to nothing because of a drought and then you're having to reseed it all the time because there's no grass there. Also, overgrazing can lead to soil compaction, erosion, weed problems, and water contamination. If there's no grass on it, then things run off of it and can run into your water. Another thing by knowing and keeping control of your pasture management is it can actually work and help you in the long run too with all the other things that I just told you about, but also for helping keep a clean environment. So that comes back to parasite prevention. So another thing when having animals is you want to have a parasite prevention protocol and plan. What are you going to do to reduce the amount of parasites or insects on your farm that could possibly lead to different things transmitted to your animals? One way you can do this is that clean environment, preventing overcrowding on your farm, prevent overgrazing, um, because these things can help reduce the presence of insects or pests that can transmit different things and different diseases. One of the other things you can do for small ruminants is become FAMACHA trained. And that helps you identify um, those blood-sucking parasites in your small ruminants that can potentially, um, potentially kill them or make them very sick. Another thing you need to think about if you have a small-scale farm is hay. Like I said before, helping with overcrowding and um, preventing overgrazing is having that gear round hay available to your animals. And so if you have the ability to have your animals and have land for pasture, for hay production, excellent. But if you don't have enough land for grazing, raising those animals and for hay production, you have to then purchase it. And you wanna be making sure that you're purchasing good quality hay for your animals because that's what's needed for good milk production. Whether you got cows or goats, you need good quality hay for milk production if you're a small scale farm. Um, like I said before, you typically, in a small scale dairy, you typically don't have access to silage. So your options are pasture, grain, um, and hay. Whether you make it yourself or you have to have the resources and the funds to purchase it. And I can tell you, the cost of hay can range from anywhere from $40 a round bale to $80 a round bale, from $6 a square bale to $15 a square bale. So think about those costs when you're thinking about whether a small scale dairy is what you wanna do. The other thing you need to think about is buying large quantities at a time. This actually sometimes can help reduce your cost but you need to make sure you have the storage for that. 
The other thing that's really important for your animals, but also for your, your business and your farm is water. Water is the most essential nutrient and you need to be able to provide access to clean water for all ages of your animals. And you need to have good quality water for them to drink, but also you need it for washing your equipment. A lactating dairy cow needs at least four and a half to five pounds of water per pound of milk production. And a goat needs one quart of water for every pint of milk, produ milk produced. So think about it. You need to have access to a lot of water when you have your animals. There are also some other normal needs that to think about from a small scale farm. Um, Dehorning and debutting those animals may be needed unless you have animals on the cow side you've selected that are going to be pulled where they're not going to um, grow horns. But if they do, you need to know how to dehorn them or disbud them or work with your veterinarian to do that. Hoof trimming is essential for either farm, either animal that you're working with. And think about in the long run, what are you gonna to do to keep your farm going? Are you going to breed those animals? So are you going to have a bull or a buck on the farm, which comes with a cost because you need to feed them and house them. And there's also a safety concern there. Or are you going to use artificial insemination to breed your animals? Are you going to be trained? Or are you going to hire somebody to do that? So that's another cost to think about. Um, and if you're gonna do it yourself, do you have the proper setup? And do you have the training to be able to breed those animals? Most cases, the small farm, small scale farm will actually have either a buck or a bull on hand, um, whether they're, they have it at their place or possibly they are leasing one from another facility during the breeding season. But these are just some costs that you need to think about and some normal needs that need to be taken care of to have these animals. The other thing you need to look at is fencing. There's a whole host of different types of fencing out there. I've seen cows stay in a single strand of electric fence, or they have three to five strands of what's called high tinsel fencing. And then there's goats. Goats like to climb and goats are escape artists. So most require a hotline on the inside and then web fencing. So that might be a part of how you determine whether you pick cows or goats as well on your farm. Or if you're doing a combination, you're going to need the web fencing. The cows will stay in the web fencing with the hotline, and it'll also keep your goats in. Fingers crossed. The other thing you need to think about is predators. You have new little babies being born every year, but you also have your big animals. So Baby animals are more susceptible to predators coming onto the farm than your large cows, but your large goats are also susceptible to predators. So you need to think about the susceptibility of predators on your farm and how you're going to keep predators out. Small farms probably need to utilize herd protection animals, whether it's dogs or llamas, and your small scale dairy farms with cows can also do the same thing, having um, llamas out in the field with your animals is, is a good thing to have to keep things like your the coyotes out. Now it's different if you have um, predators that are like the buzzards and hawks and stuff like that that are coming in. They do come in and attack um, newborn animals. So that's another reason why you need to have maybe predator dot the predator um, and you'd herd animals in there. So using dogs for predator and herd protection. The other thing you need to think about is housing. What is best? You may not need um, a castle for your animals in a million dollar setting, but it all does come down to management and how you man maintain those facilities that you do have. And Regardless of what animal you are raising on your farm, clean, dry, well-ventilated areas are needed. Bedding them with shaving straw or sawdust is really good and keeping them clean and cleaning them out routinely. I've seen everything 
single hutches being used, mega hutches, group pens. Now cows tend to be grouped by weight and age. If you're a small scale farm, maybe you're keeping the babies in, in with their moms and you're not separating them. I've seen that. It's fine. It works. Um, just remember that you do have to wean those animals at some point. So you will have to remove them from mom. And just think about it. If you're needing a, a certain amount of milk every day from your from your animals and the babies are nursing from them as well, you may not get that amount of milk if the babies are, are with them all the time. And then goats kind of like to tend to live in their own little colony, right? They like to live all together. Babies like to jump all over moms. And so typically when you're having a goat farm, babies and moms are all together. And then when they need to be weaned, you just separate them and wean them. And when they get over that weaning stage and you know they're not going to go back to try to nurse on their mom, you can put them back together. With anything, you have to think about that ounce of prevention. So providing all your animals with queen with providing them with quality feeds, clean housing can reduce sickness. Having the ability to sanitize bottles, buckets, anything you use to feed them, or if you're using hutches for your calves, cleaning them and sanitizing them in between putting new ones in. And then understanding the signs of sickness, knowing what the normal body temperature is, droopy ears, what that means, smell loose manure, what that means, changes in respira respiration. And if the animals are not moving around a lot and they're very lucid, that could be a sign of sickness. So understanding all the signs of sickness. Now, remember those little La Mancha goats that have no ears, it's gonna be hard to tell from looking at their ears if they're sick or if you have the goats, Nubians and stuff like that, they already have droopy floppy ears. That really can't be a sign of sickness in them if that's naturally what they look like. So know the other signs. Because what we're trying to do is prevent any health problems that potentially could um, really make the animals sick or, or, or that they pass away from that sickness. So some of the things you, you wanna be aware of is knowing what scours looks like, pneumonia and respiratory, clostridial infections, making sure you understand and help prevent umbilical hernias, and abscesses, bloat from getting too much grain or too much milk, broken limbs if they're living in group housing, um, and also if the environment's not clean and they're slipping, and then pink eye. Pink eye can be transmitted from eye to eye by insects. So flies can transmit those. So you wanna make sure you have a protocol in place to reduce the amount of flies. All this may seem like a lot, a lot of information was given, but in the end, you want to look at the cost involved. So know all the costs that are involved and think about that, whether you've already started or you think about getting into putting together a small farm, a small farm dairy, in this case, know all the costs, the cost of feed, raising young stock, or also raising and keeping up with those older animals. The equipment maintenance, facilities, what equipment are you going to need? The cost of a veterinarian, if he has to be called out, he or she has to be called out to take care of any of your animals, and also having a good relationship with your veterinarian. The cost of production of the products, your end product, what it's going to cost you if you want to if you want to sell it, like the marketing, the the cost involved in to making soap and making cheeses. And then those marketing costs of how you market your business. Everything comes at a cost. So you need to understand all those and work with um, entities that can help you do that and set those things up. Extension can help you look at all those numbers and know what your bottom line is. And you need to understand, you need to establish good relationships with your veterinarian, specialist in the field of cows and goats, and then working with extension agents we are all have a role in helping you succeed when you start your, your little farm up or when you start a business up. So reach out and have a good relationship with us and ask us questions. And with that, I will, I do have some special thanks to give out. 
um, to New Dawn Acres and Grassy Hill Farm in Franklin County. They provided the pictures and a lot of these pictures within the um, presentation were provided right from their farms. And they actually provided some guidance in putting this presentation together because they wanted to help those that are thinking about getting into small scale dairy farming because they've gone through it. They're in it right now. And they wanted to make sure that all your questions were answered. So if you have any questions and you'd like to reach out, Here's my contact information. Um, here's the phone number at the office I work at and my email. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions about small scale farming and getting into it or questions you have if you're already in it and you just have some questions about it. Thank you and have a great day.